fantastic. Guys, thank you for all joining this afternoon. Um, we've got a very special training session for you here. Um, this is actually my doctor, but also a personal friend of mine, Carlisle Jenkins. Um, Carlisle's been a very special person in my life, actually, for the last couple of years. Um, I first met Carlisle probably about 18 months ago now, I think. Um, and at the time, I had absolutely chronic back pain to the point where I was sleeping about four hours a night. I wasn't even sure I was going to be able to continue with Street Bees. I'd been to every specialist under the sun in London. Um, and Tucha actually introduced me to Carlisle and said, you've got to go and see this guy. Um, and what I really liked about his approach was that he didn't just zoom in on what the problem with my back was. He took a far more holistic approach to my entire lifestyle. Um, so he looked at various different parts of my body, but also what was I doing with my work? When was I switching off at night time? How much exercise was I doing? Was I making time outside of work to see my friends? Um, and we came up with a program which was a combination of how to decrease some of those stresses on my life um, and also some physical work that I did. Um, and I've now got to a point where I'm much better and much stronger physically um, than where I was 18 months ago. And it's just been, it's probably been the biggest factor that's changed my life in the last 18 months. So there you go. <laughs> um, so uh, Carlisle's uh, looking at rolling out a number of workshops um, with various businesses. So he was keen to uh, come and speak to us today about managing stress and building resilience um, in today's modern workforce. So. Without further ado, Mr. Carlo Jenkins, thank you very much. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you very much, Ollie. Nice to see you all, Street Bees. I've heard so much about you from both Touche and Ollie for so long. It's great to be in your space, lovely space it is. And I am just back from Australia after taking the family out to reconnect with, um, you know, sun, surf, <laughs> our family, their cousins, and with journeys like that, it's always the dream is you've got your kids sitting on the beach, there's sun, there's surf, but with all those kind of dreams there comes like a challenge with getting kids across the other side of the world. Our three-year-old Theo refused to get on certain flights, so we ended up literally wheeling the bag, Theo holding onto the bag, dragging his stomach through the airport on way too many occasions. There he is. <laughs> we made it, we made it back. Um, five years ago, I opened up our new practice in St. Paul's on Ludgate Hill. It's a lovely space. We have uh, therapy rooms and it's a gymnasium. So you can do one-to-one -one work with a PT, you can do group sessions. And I was on the gym floor with a client of mine who was doing some pretty heavy deadlifting. So I was very conscious that he was in the right form, doing the right technique. And I heard my name being yelled by Rachel, one of the other trainers. And I kind of had to ignore her because um, my client was in this really important moment. And I heard her yell again, Carlisle, Carlisle. And I turned and she just was pointing at her client on the ground, just going, he's gone. And her client was literally on the ground, curled up, groaning with the most awful sound you've ever heard. It was just like, Aah! And I looked at his face and I kind of realized he was having a stroke right there and then on the gym floor. And I immediately said to the guys, you need to get an ambulance now. Very lucky for Julian, the person in question, there was a, Paul, a St. Paul's event on. So there was a walking ambulance officer there within two minutes, literally. He quickly organized for a hardcore ambulance to be there within six minutes. Julian was whisked off to the London and within 40 minutes of having his stroke, was under the knife with one of the best vascular neurosurgeons you could ever get in London, saved his life. Julian made a complete recovery. And I met with Julian about six months ago. And I said, Julian, how are you doing? He's like, I'm great. I've completely changed my life. Um, I said, okay, well, could you help me out? Because I want to know what happened. Like, I know what happened, I was there, but what happened in the six, ten years before that that you think 
contributed to you having a stroke. Because Julian was training regularly, three times a week. He was only two minutes into his gym session doing mobility warm-ups on his hip. So something triggered something to happen. He told me a fascinating story. He's a law firm partner, a senior partner, he's 56. When he started that journey, like all young lawyers, the dream is to work your way to the holy grail level of becoming a partner in the firm. It's quite stressful. He got to partner and realised that not only did he have his responsibilities as a lawyer to handle the deal flow that he'd created, he had a team to look after and he had other responsibilities within the business as well. His stress level went up exponentially. 15 years at that partner level and then two big acute episodes of stress, one a family-based one and one uh, a dismissal case at work, created the perfect storm for him to have this stroke. And the, the specialist confirmed that he did not have a cholesterol plaque that blocked his artery. He didn't have a problem with his arteries failing and leaking. This was 100% down to stress. Now I started my life as a sports chiropractor, looking after athletes like James Woods. He's British, he's from Sheffield, and he is the 2019 world champion at skiing. Slope style, where they slip upside down. And now James's journey has been very interesting. He's obviously really talented as a 14 year old when I met him, but he's got a lot of skills to try and acquire to get to the level where he's performing on the international stage, going to the Olympics. And I started with helping him physically, but it became clear I had to help him with his mental, his nutrition, his recovery, the way he approached how he handled stress. And that started my interest in this framework that was holistic, looking at the whole person. And I took that framework and I said to myself as my kids arrived, I don't want to travel anymore, could I help people in the city who are out to deliver some real impact in their professional life? Could I help them do that and help them keep their health? That, that is essentially what I do. We've now had a number of people go through our program. So we've taken 909 of our clients and the, the survey we asked them to complete when they arrive to try and understand what's bringing people to my, my clinic. I want to share some of that with you. Average age is 37. They're usually professionals in a position of responsibility. Interestingly, I get a 50-50 split of guys and girls. Um, The number one reason they're seeing me, pain management brings them in the door, and it's lower back pain predominantly, aka Ollie May. Um, <laughs> they rate that pain at about six out of 10 typically. They've had it a while, they've tried lots of things to get this sorted, and it just cannot seem to budge. It's not resolved. Sounds familiar, Ollie? 80% of them have other pains going on knees, hips, shoulders, neck. Not just one musculoskeletal issue, but but multiple things that seem to come up at the same time. We also um, ask them about other parts of their life that they'll help with. So they want to move better, they want their posture to be, to be better, they want more energy, they want to fix their nutrition, they're interested in managing stress, and their fitness is something they want to change as well. By and large, all of them recognise that the way they're living, their lifestyle, is having a negative effect on their health and they want to do something to change. They all need a coffee or some soda to get started in the morning. Stimulants are a regular thing for them. More than half don't sleep fully through the night. Just under half don't get at least six hours. And they're not waking up feeling energised and refreshed. Does this sound familiar at all, guys, yet? <laughs> we also had a bit of a clanger question in there. Apart from the issues that you've come with, that you think we can help with, what are the three things in life that you feel are most out of balance that you want to change? Does anyone want to have a guess what the, the top five things are that came up for 909 Londoners? Work-life balance? Work -life balance? Yeah. yeah. Sex drive was number five. <laughs> Literally, they were having trouble engaging in one of the fundamental things that makes us human. There was a problem that was manifesting in their sex life. The next thing that we saw was they were worried about money. So the combination of debt, of 
accumulating money was a big issue for them. Happiness. While they were doing all this career and job and London life, they weren't experiencing the happiness they thought they would. Their food and their diet was huge, but stress at work was the biggest thing that everyone mentioned. And when I saw this, I was like, right, so stress at work is an issue. I'm waiting for people who have a significant problem that's affecting their lives to come to my clinic where we know we can help them. What if I could work with people before the problem turned up and help them ensure they never had those problems? And that got me thinking, like, what, what would you need to be able to do in order to engage with people in a workplace in order to, to help them like that? And that kind of started my journey on, on reaching out into the community and asking questions. I also did some research globally and I learned that 70% of the world now dies with or from a lifestyle disease. Does everyone know what a lifestyle disease is? These are things you don't catch. You make them by how you live. So whether that's 85% of cancers, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, dementias, these are all things that people make by how they live. Diseases that didn't really exist 150, 200 years ago. Our lifestyle, the way we live, isn't really respecting the two million years of ancestral gifts we've been given. And the bodies are being asked to do it for longer. We're living longer, so it starts breaking down. Um, just out of interest, does anyone in the room know anyone that has either um, a cancer or has survived a cancer? Raise your hand. Does anyone know anyone with chronic pain? Does anyone know anyone who's a diabetic? Type 2, the one that came on later in life. Does anyone know anyone who's got an autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis? Yeah? Does anyone know anyone with blood pressure issues, taking blood pressure medication or statins to manage cholesterol? Great. Does anyone know anyone with asthma that came on later in life and is taking medication for that? Does anyone know anyone that gets chronic infections, gut issues? <laughs> Does anyone know anyone with mental health stuff that's been, been a problem for them for a while? Does anyone know anyone with any viral stuff, non-HIV, that they, they constantly get sick regularly with the flu? If you put your hand up at all to any of those questions, can you put your hand up, guys? Have a look around, guys. It's touching us. This stuff is all around us. People we know, families, friends. They also are the top nine selling, best selling drugs in the world. That list of nine that we just had on the, on the board there are the top nine selling lifestyle drugs in the world. All time. I call them membership programs. Once you go on some of those drugs, you never come off them. And it goes against the business model. If they're going to manage your lifestyle disease, they keep you on that to manage it. Did you know that a number of them are completely reversible? If someone makes significant changes to their lifestyle and does it consistently over time, you can come off a lot of those medications and you can turn that, those diseases around. It's not easy, but it can be done. The summary, from what I've gathered research-wise, is that if you're 40 and above, don't smoke, there's pretty much a 70 to 80% chance you're going to die of one of four things. It'll either be a heart attack, a stroke, cancer, or dementia. Dementia wasn't on that list 10 years ago. That's suddenly becoming more of an issue earlier in people's lives than it was before. Everyone asks, what about genetics? Now, I too asked about genetics. How much of a role does genetics play in these diseases? And I think of it a bit like Romeo and Juliet. So he, he wrote that play Shakespeare 500 years ago, and the script for Romeo and Juliet has not changed but lots of different actors and different companies have expressed that same script in always unique ways. No two productions are exactly the same, even if it's in the same company. So likewise, we inherit a script, a code from our parents and their parents, and your code is not going to change over your life. But there are actors that act on the code and tell which genes to make certain proteins and which genes to switch off and not make certain proteins. I think that's a simple way to think of it. Genetics is 30% of the story. Lifestyle choices compromise about 40% of it. Then we're looking at things like environment, your access to healthcare, and your social situation. 
That's a huge opportunity, those lifestyle choices, 40%. This got me thinking, right. What affects the gene? And this is where it gets pretty complicated. So you've got a gene, then you've got a protein that sits on top of that, that exerts what we call epigenetic control. It tells the gene what to do. The thing that affects the protein that decides that is called the exposome. The sum total of everything you've ever been exposed to since you were conceived. So from inside the womb till now, everything you've been exposed to in the air, in your mother's blood, in the food you've had, in the diseases you've had, in the antibiotics you've had, in the social situations you've had, in the jobs that you've done well in, in the stuff that we've all failed, all of those have had an effect on your epigenetics and the switches that switch certain genes on and off. They're suggesting that the, the level of complexity in that exposome is to the yotabyte level. So 10 to the power of 8. Infinitely complex for us to make sense of. At this point, I was like, well, what, how are we going to help people with that? <laughs> um, I then said to myself, OK, let's step back a bit and look at the bigger picture. We know that medical history is important that lifestyle is important, that exercise is important, nutrition, that mental health is a factor, our cardiovascular health is a factor, bone health, liver function, kidney function, metabolic function, inflammation. That is literally where we start with an assessment. We also look at 39 blood-based biomarkers, our ability to use our brain with cognitive function, all aspects of lifestyle around diet and our perception of stress, and we build an assessment for individuals, and they get an, a personal score out of 100. 70 and above, you are healthy by NHS WHO standards. 50 to 69, you've got some work to do to get out of the amber and into the green. Below 50, there's some risk in the system, some specific things you need to address to move yourself away from potentially developing one of those diseases. So we got asked to do this for a company. Vita Coco. Has everyone heard of Vita Coco, the coconut water oil company? What I'm presenting to you is the combined data of the business. So each individual in that business had this assessment done. Their personal scores was kept totally private, it was never shared with anyone. But the anonymized group data we reported to the group. And this helped us have a conversation about well-being that was objective. Where are they at? How does it compare to the normal population. What are the opportunities? If you're going to make some time investment in this, where should we do it? And then how do you guys learn best? And what's the best way to make this fun and engaging and part of how we do business? What do you reckon they scored out of 100 as a group? They're roughly the same age as you guys. 49. They're in the red. Only 4% healthy by NHS, WHO standards. 44% of the group had some risk in it. Blew me away, blew them away, blew the CEO away. Whoa, what's going on? How does it compare? We've done a number of assessments across this and the average that we get back is 59. So they're well below average. There's a lot of risk in there. And at the same time, they were under massive commercial pressure. Vita Coco was the only coconut water brand for about a decade. Then Pepsi and Coke introduced their own brands and using their power of distribution and marketing just literally crushed their market share from 76 to, to 47 in about 18 months. So what they were doing in the past was not going to work. And the CEO, Giles, was like, I'm going to take that market share back. We're going to go back. I don't know if my team's ready or up for it. Can you help me get them ready from a well-being perspective? So that was the challenge. They weren't ready. They had a massive commercial challenge ahead of them. Giles will never give up, never say no. He was going to do it. He wants his team to be able to do it with him and keep their health. Or could we get them even better while they're doing that? So it was a really good opportunity to go, right, what do we do? We dive into the data and they had lots of health risks that popped up that gave us you know, where we should focus some of our attention. The one that really surprised me was their their risk of anxiety and depression was, was, was pretty high for a young group. Um, there's some easy fixes in there, and I could spend all day going through the individual stuff that we found, but there were simple things like they weren't just eating enough vegetables. They were dodging salads regularly. The exercise levels were dropping outside of, say, June, July. 
they were um, not getting regular sleep, all pretty obvious stuff. And, and I guess you guys would all know this stuff as well. And in fact, we all know this stuff. But here was the objective data that doesn't lie telling them it's here. This is the opportunity. This is the problem. It meant we could have some really interesting conversations with them as a group and some workshops around how they want to learn. So we'd spent some time designing this and we ended up with a combination of personal coaching, some workshops around specific learning content, some competitions, and then some online stuff that they would have access to whenever they want. Not overwhelming, not too much. We took them to places like Smeg Kitchen and polled them on what they'd want to learn to cook if we had a private chef show them how to do certain things. We put them in little groups like Master Chef. They got to shown how to do it by the, the, the private chef and then we sent them off to go and get involved. And they were learning skills some of them had never had before. Like literally three people had never cut an onion or garlic. <laughs> Can we just do a poll on that? <laughs> One of them from Scotland who had literally, literally not eaten a salad his whole life, he said. <laughs> the thing about this was it was a group learning experience. They were getting their hands physically doing stuff together. It was a bit of competition, but it was pretty lighthearted. And they came out of that and decided to form some lunch clubs. So they'd form teams of four. Once a week, someone would bring in a salad for the four people. So you had, you had some learn, some skills, it translated into stuff they were doing in the office and they, were, they built on that. The long and short of it was, over the, the, the two cycles of, of interventions that we delivered, we were able to move their number as a group to 64 in that time. Most importantly, took 44% that were at high risk and got that down to 11% grew the healthy population from 4% to, to 30% whilst they were in that, that commercial challenge. They got above average compared to the rest of the population. We were also tracking their engagement scores through this, so their ENPS scores. That was on the floor when they first started looking at this. 2016, 19%, that's when the Coke Pepsi challenge arrived. We're now seeing it 55% with 100% engagement. They got healthier through that. What happened in the market? They went from 76% market share, we, sorry this is jumping guys, and then at the bottom there, 216, they have clawed it back in really tough market conditions. So we're seeing good, good benefits all around. Um, we got awards for this, this, this uh, journey, recognised as not only a wellbeing program that helped resilience, but literally helped with the engagement side of things. We've done some work with other businesses as well. So what? I guess you're all asking, what's that got to do with us? At the heart of this was stress. And for all of us, especially in scaling businesses like yours, that's the nature of it. You signed up for that. You knew what you signed up for. It's part of growing something that doesn't exist. So I want to spend the rest of the workshop talking about what I think stress actually is and give you some, some simple tools that you can use as individuals and group to change your approach to stress. What is it? I think it's just simply your body responding to demand or threat. Now, a simple example is exercise. You're asking it to spend energy specifically. That's stressful for the body. Then we hope the body recovers from that and learns how to do that a bit better. And then we gradually stress it a bit more and we get fitter. Does that make sense? I want to dive into this a bit and find out what's happening in the brain, because that's where it's all mediated. Now, when I started the brain journey, it was through James Woods, who came out of a half pipe and landed on his head and completely concussed himself and could no longer, even with his eyes closed in a dark room, even visualise turning that way. So his brain had had a trauma, a genuine threat, and it was like, I'm not even going to let you go that way in your mind. So I had to undercover and go and get training all over the world to try and help him recover that ability to do that. So my insights are that the brain is really complex. And whatever anyone tells you, we know nothing about it. In the 1500s, 
the map of the, of, the, of the world looked like that. And they thought they had it covered. Is our brain understanding and our awareness of how the brain works as detailed as that? Well, one of the leading researchers at Harvard who looks at the brain, its mapping, its connections, and how it develops, suggests that if the brain and our understanding of it was a mile long, we have literally walked about three inches. We just don't know what we don't know yet. But I think there's five things I can share with you that we do know that are going to help us. Um, your knowledge workers, you're paid to think. Your decision making, interpersonal skills, they're valued. And how you solve problems requires you to use that brain. That's called the cortex. And it's the bit that separates us from other animals. That cortex doesn't exist on its own. It's physically, like directly connected with wires to two other brains. The feeling brain or limbic brain and the doing brain, the brain stem. What does the doing brain do? Your heartbeat, your breathing, your respiration, your digestion, your hormones, your eyes opening and closing when the light's changing. It's processing all the hearing. It's feeling vibration. It's the bit that gets the sex drive up and running. All that stuff is happening in a part of your body that is physically connected to your thinking brain. So our body is not just there to carry the thinking box to work. It's literally connected to how it works. Sounds simple, doesn't it? But we don't think about it like that. It's got inputs going in, the brain. How many? They reckon 250 million zeros and ones every half second. Every half second, every half second, every half second. So there's three levels to the brain we have to understand and appreciate and have a relationship with. I ask myself, inputs consist of what? And when they arrive in the brain, what does it do? So a really simple example is, I'm going to cross the road. And I use my eyes to assess the speed and distance of a car or a bus. And I'm making a judgment about whether there's any threat to me crossing the road. If there is threat, I don't walk. If there's no threat, I walk. Pretty simple. That's happening all the time, every second, every time data is arriving in your brain, that's constantly happening. The question it asks to process that stuff quickly, the first filter, is this a threat? And if there is threat, its natural thing is to protect. Again, simple concept. Who'd like to feel it? Who's the bravest bee? I need a volunteer. It's very safe. Everyone keeps their clothes on, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, mate. What's your name? Islam. Islam. Yeah. Do you mind standing up on the stage, Islam? We're going to do a simple experiment. So I'm looking at your output from the brain into the body, and I'm going to do a, a subtle challenge to see if we can create a low-level threat for it. Okay. You up for that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late. Right. So what, what I need first, Islam, is a simple measure of some output, and I'm going to keep it really simple. With your legs dead straight at the knees, I want you just to slowly go down as far as your hamstrings will let you and you need to stop the first time you feel any kind of tension. So don't force it past that. Okay. okay. All right. Yep, that's where you felt it? Yeah. Just there. Great. Come up for us, mate. So what I'd like you to do, you wear glasses 90% of the time? Yeah, I wear contact lenses half, like most of the time. So. Okay, so we'll keep, keep these on. Yeah. Can you see, um, actually, that Logitech there, can you yeah. read that at that distance there? Yeah. Okay. So with your feet together and with your head not moving, okay. Okay, I want your eyes just to follow that Logitech for me. Okay. okay? So you're just going to keep the eyes, no head, mate, just, just your eyes. That's it. So we're just following that with the eyes only. It. Keep the head still, mate. Keep your eyes on the Logitech. Don't lose it. 
Don't lose it, follow it, keep it on. That's it, good, good, keep going, keep going. Well done, team, awesome mate, good work, great. Can you just roll down and, and exactly the same thing as soon as you feel any tension? <laughs> Good. Okay. Cool. Come up. Can you stand on one leg for me? Great. <laughs> 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 Let's see, here we go. Okay, uh, try and hold still. <laughs> so wait till you're steady, right? I have to take my shoes off. Anyway. Your shoes off? Yeah. <laughs> Great, tell me when you're ready and I'll move it, right? Yeah, I'm gonna fall. <laughs> Just want you to keep your eyes on this, that's it. Good, all right. Can you roll down again? Just the moment you feel any tension. Good. Other leg. <laughs> and follow this, man. You ready? <laughs> roll down for us now. As soon as you feel anything in those hammies. Okay. So it took me a while to find it, but there's a visual field that Islam struggles with when I'm asking him to do a balance thing at the same time. And when I got in there, the brain was like, whoa, 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 protect. And he's like, mm. that's how sensitive the system is, guys. Everyone's got little visual deficits. Um, why don't you buddy up and see if you can find some visual deficits on your buddy? This is a really simple drill. There's no pain. The worst thing you might feel is a bit of heart beating, yeah. yeah, and the breathing changing a bit. Have something they can look at. Start with two feet together. The head does not move, and then you just maybe draw the alphabet and gradually speed up. So that by the time you get to J and K, you're going really fast. The person who's watching, you have to follow the target. And then you just gently go down, test. If you get no change or you're better, pop on one leg. Try it again until you get some perception of threat and how sensitive your system is to this. Five minutes, guys. Let's go. Do it on one on each other. <laughs> Who got worse in their ability to bend down? And Who got worse? Who felt some tension? When their visual system was challenged, who felt some tension? A bit less than half. Who got better? Right. What, why would that happen, guys? You didn't do any stretching. You just did one bend, very gently, and then you put some visual input in, and something changed. Any ideas? Yeah. You fired up your fight or flight system. Has everyone heard of that? The sympathetic system? No? We're going to talk about it now because this is really important. I call it the Red Baron. So the Red Baron was a World War I fighter pilot for Germany and he was confirmed highest kills. When Manfred von Richthofen was in his plane, he was not sightseeing. He was out there to take down the enemy. So he was in on mode. He was there to get things done. That's kind of like your sympathetic nervous system. So this is the part of the nervous system that creates energy for you. Now, the extreme end of that is a 10 out of 10 fight or flight, I'm about to get mugged, I run or I defend myself. You just played with that system. And for some people, the visual threat was enough for the system to be, whoa, I'm out of here, and shut down, protect. For others, it's just warming up. It's like, I like that. I really like that visual stimulus, that helps. <laughs> but it's to illustrate how sensitive that system is. Just visual challenge there. Now the other thing that happens with that system is pretty much when the sun comes up, that guy's on. And they think ancestrally this is because the sun being up would mean we had one, to not be eaten, 
Two, find food and shelter. So the body needed to spend energy. So anytime you're awake, that system's pretty much running the show. It's normal for it to be on. Now we're not going to be 10 out of 10 sympathetic Red Baron, but we're probably like threes and fours, peaking up to sixes sometimes, we have a bad meeting with someone, coming back to three, peaking up to seven or eight, tax time of year, come back to four. It does this constant shift. The thing I want you to get is that any time that is on, it's depleting resources. It's taking energy and you're spending it. And there's a cost to that, which is creating inflammation in the body. And it's totally normal. The inputs into the brain are deciding how far down that spectrum you go in the waking day. The red baron, you're at the right at the end. If you're seven, eight, nine out of 10 every day, every day, every day, you're depleting faster than you probably should. For short periods, not a problem. For scaling up businesses, that's the environment. You're in that environment. Deliver, deliver, deliver. There's pressure to deliver, grow, scale. That's always on in the environment. So you're gonna be susceptible to that in the environment. That's cool. There's another system. If the feeling and doing part of the brain is in the red all the time, do you think the thinking part can operate at its best? Short periods, you can do it. You can grit, muscle through. But the research says that if your system is in high sympathetic tone for a long period of time, your cognitive output goes down. So the trick is recognizing it and thinking about it like this. We're always gonna have stress. The nature of this business has stress, the nature of life in the 21st century has stress. I think of it like a bucket. We're always gonna have threat. And in that bucket I've got work, I've got family, I've got relationships, I've got people that get ill all of a sudden, I've got all the regulatory stuff we have to do. I've got, there's loads of stuff that go in that bucket. As the bucket fills up to the brim, the overflow is me feeling I'm struggling mentally, I've got physical pain, my digestion system's not quite there, I'm a bit angry, I need coffee, have to have sugar. This is the body reaching for more energy. This is the body giving you a sign that the Red Baron's been flying a bit too long. So I'm not here to say change what you're doing at work, how you guys work. I'm here to say that bucket is not a fixed size. You can grow it. If you grow the bucket, the baseline stress is easy to cope with. Because when that acute stress comes along, a sick family member, a busy period at work, or something major, you have the capacity to handle it. But if you're constantly operating at bucket full, anything new is overload territory. Does that make sense? How do we grow the bucket? Any ideas? How do you grow your capacity to handle stress? Meditation. Meditation, fantastic. When you meditate, the science says you move out of the thinking brain, you get more blood flow in the feeling brain, more blood flow down into the doing brain. What else? Exercise. exercise. The act of exercising, your respiration has to change, your heartbeat has to change, you're getting the doing brain to do stuff at a higher level. And the fitter you are, the bigger your bucket. Hands down, the science says that. Anyone else got any ideas? Sleep. Sleep. Absolutely. That's the daytime system, the sympathetic red baron. There's another system, the complete opposite of that. And if she comes, I'll call her the green goddess. The green goddess is what we call the parasympathetic system. So sympathetic is spending energy. Parasympathetic builds energy, typically on at night. So when you're asleep, the body's busy cleaning your brain, cleaning all the cells in the body, taking out the garbage, taking in the nutrients so the body can grow. If you've exercised, it's trying to build more capillaries into those muscles. That green goddess bit, the rest and recovery part, really critical to your battery. It is the bit that grows your bucket. 
Does that make sense? We've got these two systems. I just showed you how sensitive that, that red one is. How do we get the green goddess going? Meditation, exercise is one. And it's not during the exercise, it's after that the green goddess comes and does the recovery, unless you drink too much. <laughs> <laughs> and essentially today, I want to show you how to modify your inputs into your brain, specifically the feeling brain and the doing brain, to turn those to green. 60 seconds or less. That'd be good. If you all know how to do this, you can support each other in doing it. Because the research says if you, in the day, can get a bit of green, even five to ten minutes, you are infinitely more resourceful and have more resilience. If that's a regular thing that happens in the day. So, number one, feeling your pulse is called interoception. Listening to your body turns things green. So you can either find your pulse just here in your neck, so you go down the corner of your jaw, just dip down, keep your fingers flat, don't press too hard, and just listen. Or it's on your wrist here. Follow your thumb down, there's a bony point, and gently just touch that area there. When you've got it, just keep it there. The mere act of doing this for 60 seconds can bring your blood pressure points down by up to 20 points. So your systems, you're starting to listen to the feeling, feeling the doing brain. The heartbeat, listening to your heartbeat switches you from red to green. Your attention goes out of thinking into the body. The next thing is your breathing. So if you look at the screen, guys, follow this. We're going to inhale for four, exhale for six. Inhale, three, two, one. Exhale, five, four, three, two, one. Try and get your diaphragm engaged in this. Inhale, exhale. Do your pulse at the same time. Stack them together. Pulse and breathing. You're listening to your body. You're actively breathing out more than you're breathing in. Breathing out is parasympathetic activation. You're turning the green on. And the final thing, guys, if you have those two going and you gently press on your closed eyes, listening to your pulse and breathing, you switch off the visual system. So, pulse, eyes, breathing. I'll count to you for the breathing. We're going to go in three, two, one, out, five, four, three, two, one. In, three, two, one. Out. Five, four, three, two, one. In, three, two, one. Out. Five, four, three, two, one. That should be enough. Just check your body. How does, does that feel different to before? We just did about 60 seconds of it. And when you stack the three together, we've seen blood pressure come down, heart rate come down, yawns pop out of the body. <laughs> what you just learnt was how to be flexible with your autonomic nervous system. How to take maybe a three out of ten Red Baron, move it across to genuine green. And it seems that being resilient, keeping our health, and working at a high level is all about that flexibility, keeping that ability to switch. Okay, I need to be in red, that's normal. I'm in a meeting, I've got this due, I'm okay being in red. I don't need to be in red. It'd be a good time to go into green. You know how to, how to do that now. It's not easy, but now you all know this. Is there a, is there a safe space in this office where people can go 
not be interrupted, not be on tech? Is there like a green space, I call them? Toilets. Toilets. <laughs> Back to sex drive, are we? <laughs> That's a good idea. If you have the space, and I think you guys do, even just a corner designated green zone where people can go and just literally do that for 60 seconds when they know they won't be interrupted and there's, there's no... That's a simple, simple strategy you can put in the office here to kind of get that flexibility in the system. Another thing I find really helpful is start the day with it. First thing in the morning in bed, finish the day with it. See, when we go to sleep, we want to go into green really quickly. That helps the body do its best recovery. And you're actively driving it if you do that in the half hour before you go to bed. Does that make sense? I have some time for questions and answers now. Are there some like very quick exercises or moves that you would want to show to the team that can help with these quick breaks, especially if they are sitting all day, for example, in front of a laptop? Number one question you need to ask is, does every meeting need to be with technology? Or can we do a walking meeting? Yeah, can you do a walk and talk? Even if it's just around the office, not out. But walking and talking, more green. If you can get out and do a meeting out every day, brilliant. That's a simple one. You get the movement, you're doing something with your physiology, and if you want to throw in some squats together, then, then great. But <laughs> <laughs> if you set out to schedule one of your, one of your meetings that day, right, one of them has to be a walking meeting. Who, who's it going to be with? All right, I'll check with that person. Do we need our tech with us, or can we walk and talk? That's a really powerful way just to kind of get some steps up, get the body moving, and still have the meeting and not interrupt your workflow. Great question, Touche. Did you guys learn something? Yeah? Is it going to happen in the business? Is it, is it? I wanted three takeaways just to leave you with. The body's not there to carry your brain around. It's directly connected to it. It actually drives how well it works. And the stuff we're doing now is going to pop up in one or two decades' time in terms of health. The numbers aren't good, and the people that have come before us are showing us that the way they did it leads to the body breaking down, creating diseases. You don't have to have that. It's what we do now that counts, not what we do at the end of our work. And resilience is about growing your bucket, your capacity to handle stress. Stress is always going to be there. It's part of the package. But your capacity to handle it is within your control. Meditating, exercising, getting good sleep, the right food, brilliant. You've also got to have that flexibility in your system to switch from green to green from red. To pump the green, I call it. It doesn't come without a little bit of effort. Pulse, breathing and eyes is not much. But you've got to actually do it for it to happen. And you've got to support each other in doing it. If you notice someone's not reacting or responding like they normally would, you, you sense they're under a bit more pressure, let's go for a walk. Let's do the green together. Just get in there and grab each other and help each other. Because no one can see it in themselves when they're going through it. And it's the team that's going to help each other get flexible as opposed to you on your own. Thanks for your time, guys. I hope you've enjoyed that.